Hello, and welcome to the Art Students League of New York. My name is John Variano, and I'm an instructor of painting and drawing here at the League. I'm standing here in Studio 7, a legendary space at the League, renowned for its beautiful north light. And I'm here to discuss this palette and the man who developed it. That man was Frank Vincent Dumond. And for the better part of 60 years, starting in 1893 until his passing in 1951, he taught thousands of students the principles of painting here in the silvery light, as he would say, of this space. Some of those are some of the most illustrious names that you'll hear in American art. Norman Rockwell, George O'Keefe, James Montgomery Flagg, Eugene Spiker, and John Marin, just to name a few. But more significant for someone like me is the number of important artists and instructors who continue to teach his principles and convey his legacy, part of which was this palette. My instructor, Frank Mason, took over teaching here at the League in 1951 upon Dumont's passing and continued to teach in this space until he passed away in 2009. So that lineage of teaching those principles and this palette continued for well over a century. This palette went through many iterations and Dumont would have developed it over time. This was his last variation of it from the 1930s. His influences would have been many. As a student in Paris, he would have been exposed, of course, to the academic teaching that he was gaining at the Academy Julien. This palette is a reflection of that. As students, we would have to think about value primarily, which is really the foundation of why this is so important. One of the most difficult things for artists and painters to do is to maintain their value relationships and the pitch of their painting that was critical to someone like Dumond and Mason, and frankly, any good painter. The organization of your subject into light and dark. We work out of the middle, represented by orange and ochre value. The upper register would be the lights, the lower register would be the shadows, and you'd have half tones in the middle transitioning from one to the other. Essentially, a musical analogy would be an upper octave, a lower octave, and middle C octave. This would have been the thinking in terms of how we organize this palette and how we use the palette. The colors that you see here are colors that are following a value scale, but are colors that you would see in nature. The colors are as such. Violets, why the violets? They represent atmosphere and a movement of color through space. This is an atmosphere plane that always exists and it impacts all colors as you go back into the landscape. The blue scale represents sunny day, blue sky. Gray scale, gray day. The greens, transmitted light greens, lighter to darker. Transmitted light meaning light passing through the leaves. One leaf, very intense, like stained glass. Two leaves together, a little darker. Three leaves, five leaves, a hundred leaves, gets that much darker. Light passing through. This was the foundation. The cadmiums represented the value scale that we followed to mix our values because they step rather cleanly from yellows to the reds but they also provided a basis for earth tones. You can see that there's no earth tones on this palette. Dumont didn't believe in mixing cadmiums and earth tones, but you can easily mix up earth tones using any of the cools with these cadmium colors. So this was what we worked with. When we went to Vermont with Mason in June for his month long workshop in landscape painting, he expected us to mix up this palette and we would work in the field all week long then on Saturdays, he would critique us at a place called Harry's Barn. And we would bring our best painting from the week, and he would critique us based on what we told him about the type of day we were painting. He wouldn't see the actual subject, but he would be able to conceptually follow what we were presenting to him and follow this palette and show us where we were going wrong. Usually it was pitch. Usually it was a value problem, more than anything. Color as well, but usually value. And that's what was so important about working out of the middle and understanding the pitch that you needed for the sky planes, for the ground planes, and for the uprights. Generally, the lightest thing in, the, in your painting is the sky, generally. Not always, but a lot of the time, it's the sky that's the brightest. Second brightest is the ground planes, and then the uprights. Barns, trees, cows, whatever it may be, people, anything that's an upright plane. 
and it makes sense, logical. We would often start our paintings with a veil of this middle value or really orange value violet. And that would immediately express a certain amount of feeling of atmosphere in the piece. Then we would work colors into this. In the foreground, where colors are richer, we would dominate with earth tones or the cadmiums influenced by some of these to create earth tones and bring them back spatially into the violet so that they reduce in intensity. They would lose their yellow and red element as they went back in space, which is what happens optically in nature. The sky plane would require a considerable amount of time. And we would really consider not only the type of day, sunny or gray, but also where the sun was and how the light was moving across chromatically as well as value. Mason, when he would look at our pieces on Saturdays, he would ask us questions. What type of day was it? Blue or gray? Where was the sun? Low in the horizon? Early morning, late afternoon, early evening? Or midday? And then finally, where was your effect? What did you want the viewer to look at? Where was your main effect on your painting? Where was high C? So we would start with earthier tones at the foreground. That's orange value, middle value essentially. Some of the grays moving in. And perhaps some yellow. Anything within an ochre slash sienna family that you would see in the earth, right? Dirt, burnt leaves, old grass. These types of tones would be in your foreground. You'd move that back. As you went back spatially, the yellow element would diminish a bit and it would get cooler as you went back. The sky plane could influence it, or the violets could influence it. As we spoke, this represented blue day. Let's consider a blue day early. The values are the lightest in the sky, so I don't want to be anywhere in this neighborhood. Even orange value is too dark. Orange value, even though it's in lights, according to our octave, is still too dark for the sky unless it's the underplane of a storm cloud. So, you would be perhaps here with your darkest notes in a regular sky. That would be it. And going all the way towards white. This is cobalt in its character. So you would step from cobalt, which has a little bit more red in it, and you would progressively get less red, more of a yellow element, moving into the ceruleans, manganese, Cerulean. As you're coming very close to sun energy, you're going towards very high keyed cool greens represented by the thalo or viridian, let's say. And as you get very close, perhaps a touch of the warmth of yellow coming in, but you have to be very careful with yellow, of course, because you don't want your sky to appear green. But you want to express that intense sun energy. So this was essentially a progression that you would consider moving across the sky. The progression would also be existing at the horizon. At the horizon, you have the moisture of the earth and the warmth of the earth impacting the flow of light. Light is moving through that atmosphere. So there, you'd be moving into the pinks, warmer, these are cadmium red based pinks towards the alizarin. These are colors that you really see in Vermont. These are exaggerated now, they're very heightened, but this was the concept to go from warmer to cooler, lighter to darker in the sky plane. And depending on where the sun was, you would actually have a diagonal type of approach. So, Perhaps there was greater illumination in this part of the painting, and then you get progressively darker and cooler as you went up there. When I say cooler, though, I should really emphasize and say more of a red element in the blues of the sky as opposed to a greenish blue. 
So you're moving more towards a red element of, let's say, an ultramarine, which is essentially a violet character, right? So over here, perhaps this is a blue that we'd be seeing at that end of the spectrum. Here, we'd be seeing that kind of plane. At the horizon, this. Perhaps that's a little bit too yellow it's reading. A little bit more pink. And then at this end, more of an alizarin, cooler character. So that is more of a blue red as opposed to a yellow red. That would be sky. You would do the same for a gray sky. And you would change this at different times of day, obviously. So the sky was critical because the sky influenced everything on the ground. Once you had your sky pitched properly, then you could really consider how all of that would be impacting the ground planes. And the ground planes, in shadow, you'd be at orange value, let's say. The shadow on a sunny day with sunlight would be around that value right here. Not the shadow under a tree, the open shadow that you would see on a field. Very bright planes would be against that. Notice how this reads a shadow against the high keyed green light there. So here you would have these masses of light playing against these masses. Notice how that reads as light against more of a shadowy feeling on the ground. Your trees would move then in this direction. Remember, you're outside, so there's a lot of illumination coming into all of your shadows and your darks. So we would start our upright masses not too dark, right? We would be around this range. And that would be upright value. So even your lights on an upright plane would not necessarily be as light as that ground plane unless it was actually a top plane. And depending on the time of day, if the sun is lower in the horizon, then all of the greens are going to be influenced by the pinks because the light that's manifesting itself through the landscape would be a pink light, essentially. And so therefore, anything that that pink light touches is going to be impacted by that energy. So you would possibly see some of this kind of quality in the greens on the ground. When you're dealing with the green lights on the trees, Perhaps you're going a little bit darker, but still with a little bit of this kind of energy into it. You can have higher light planes on the trees, some notes, but you have to be careful. The overall feeling of the lights on the trees had to be subordinate to the lights on the ground, again, unless it's top plane. On the shadow side of the tree, all of the top plane greens would be influenced by what? Blue sky. Now the sun doesn't dominate on this side. So now these greens are essentially these cool notes, cool greens moving on this side of the tree. And you'll see this in nature. So what I showed you here is essentially how we would think about using the box and painting out of doors. This was not meant to be a method. Dumond and Mason never intended this to be the way to paint a landscape. You still had to observe what was happening in nature and, and go after those effects and those colors. It becomes a little too easy sometimes to just dip into one of these colors and just put it down. That is not the point. This is a conceptual idea of how to think about light moving through space. And that is what Dumond intended. Dumond didn't encourage writing notes. He didn't write any of this stuff down. He didn't write books. He believed in absorbing this knowledge by osmosis, by observation, by working. What he was concerned with was not teaching you how to paint, but teaching you how to see and how to think. This conceptual understanding would not paint a picture for you, but it would provide a foundation so that you were not a slave to what you were seeing. You could observe and use that as inspiration and then use your concepts to interpret that. So it's that prismatic flow of light through atmosphere that Dumond was concerned about and that he wanted to use 
a method of conveying that knowledge. This was essentially a learning tool. Dumont talked about the invisible rainbow covering the earth that we all had to see or learn how to see. This was his manifestation of seeing that rainbow in terms of paint, and we're all the beneficiaries of it.